Hello everyone, my name is Mark Tabor. I'm a painter and in this video I'm going to demonstrate how to make a color chart. I'm talking about making something like this. What this is are two paints straight out of the tube that are mixed together in equal increments and laid out on a grid. Why should you even do this? If you're a beginning painter it's very important to gain experience with mixing paints and to learn what happens when you mix your different colors together by actually doing it. And the advantage of doing it with a color chart is it will be, first of all, a very systematic process, so you'll get a thorough understanding of what happens in a way that will be, make sense. And also, when you finish your color chart, you'll have a permanent record of what two paint combinations are capable of. So, in the future, if you're trying to figure out how you're going to get a particular color that you'd like and you're not really sure which two paints will get you there, well, if you've got a pile of color charts to refer to, and here are some of my examples, and I have many more, then it's a simple matter of flipping through your color chart and saying, well, what do I want? Which color do I want? And with a record like this, it's very easy to figure out which two paints you need. So it's a pretty simple process, but if you see it done, you'll understand more completely how to do it. And that's what this video is all about. So let's paint. Here's the goal. It's a piece of paper that is eight inches wide by six inches high. Each square is about five eighths of an inch on each side. The black stripe at the top is important. That is what will show you how much hiding power your mixture has. And on the back, I wrote down the name of the two colors that I'm mixing that are located in the same relationship as they are on the opposite side. You need to remember what you mixed. It's shiny because I put a coat of varnish on so that the paper is going to be protected because if you're going to be referring to this thing on a regular basis, you want to make sure that you've got some kind of protective coating. Here's the beginning. You'll see a dot at the corner of each square. It's not necessary to trace the complete square. You'll see what I mean once we start to paint. I created this using a cartoon. If you want the template for this cartoon, send me an email and you'll receive a PDF that, with instructions that will show you how to make this. Each hole is located at the corner of each square so I can make a dot. This is how you use the cartoon. You start with your paper cut out to size. Next, you attach your cartoon using two pieces of tape. The tape is important because you don't want the cartoon moving around while you are applying the darts, and the tape will help you do this. Next, you're going to use a really sharp pencil to mark each dot. A mechanical pencil is ideal because it provides you with a consistent point. Next, take your pencil hold it perpendicular to the paper, and give it a little twist to get a clean mark. I'm only going to do a few, so you get the idea. It's important that you do all of your dots all in one shot. Don't move the cartoon, don't open it up to take a peek, because if you do that, you're liable to shift things around, and that will mean that your squares won't be perfectly aligned. The two paints I'm going to mix in this demo are right here. The name on the tube, Dollar Green and Cadmium Yellow Light, is what you might think of as the common name. You should be in the habit of looking at the more precise scientific quote-unquote name, such as PY35, which is the standard color term for Cadmium Yellow Light. And in this particular brand that I'm using, the pigment is called Cadmium Zinc Sulfide. So if you want to compare products, you need to look at those pigment labels. And here's the brush. It's a bright. It's got a slash cut tip, and it is a little bit more narrow than the squares that we're going to be painting. This is the preferred brush that I like for this exercise because it's really good at making squares. You need a palette knife to mix the paint, and you need a mixing surface. I'm mixing acrylic, so I'm using glass. Begin by squeezing a little bit of cadmium yellow light onto the palette. Here's a little tip. Each and every time that you squeeze paint out of the tube, you'll see that there's a little bit of paint that's on the flat end of the tube. Make sure you take a rag and wipe the thread clean and especially wipe that flat end clean because 
that surface is what makes the seal with the cap. And if there is any paint whatsoever dried on that end, you will have a leak in your cap and your paint will dry out before you finish using it. I know from experience that with this particular combination, the thalo green has a very powerful impact on the cadmium yellow. So you'll see that I added a very tiny amount of the thalo green to my patch of yellow. Don't want to move too quick. Don't want to add a big blob of one paint into another because what we're going to do here is create a set of swatches that will show a gradual transition from one color to another. Don't look at the palette for the color that you are aiming for. Instead, just measure out a little bit of paint from one pile, mix it into the other, and then take your brush and on a strip of paper, paint a small swatch like I've done here. Clean your palette knife completely between each mixing session. Add just a little bit more paint to the yellow, mix it thoroughly, and then paint another swatch next to the previous one on your strip of paper. This is the procedure. Take a little bit of the green, add it to your pile of yellow, mix it thoroughly, paint a swatch on your strip of paper. Make sure that swatch goes all the way to the end of the paper. You'll see that I've put a piece of scrap underneath it in order to make sure that I have complete coverage. Clean your palette knife and then repeat. And continue doing this until you have a pile of paint that looks indistinguishable from the green that's straight out of the tube. You should have a pile of strips that look like this. The next step is to cut them out. Take a pair of scissors, trim off an end of the strip, just like this, so that what you get is a swatch that has paint that reaches the edge of the strip on at least three sides. Make sure that your swatches are arranged in the same order as you painted them. Don't shuffle them because you'll get confused. Here are all the swatches I painted. The extreme ends are the yellow and green straight out of the tube, unmixed. I couldn't lay this out in a single line because my camera angle is not wide enough, but when you do this on your own, you should lay these out in one line. Notice on the yellow end that the transition between each swatch is very subtle. You can barely tell the difference between one swatch to another, but over multiple swatches, the change in color is obvious. However, down here on this green section where my pencil is pointing, you can see a big jump between the two swatches. That's because I got in a hurry and I added a little bit too much green at once. And this is a situation you want to avoid, at least at when you're doing this in the beginning. The best bet for you, if you're a beginner, is to aim for the smooth transition on the yellow end throughout the entire strip. This will help you gain greater control and confidence. Another thing you need to look out for is the way you apply the paint to the swatch. You have to be very consistent in the amount of paint you apply, the pressure you apply. Look at where my pencil is pointing. You'll see another jump in the color of the green. And that is not a mixture problem, that's a paint application problem. So another part of this challenge is to be very consistent in the application process. There are 42 swatches here. I only need 10 and two of them are straight out of the tube, so that leaves eight mixtures. I've chosen eight swatches of mixtures. The goal is to show an even jump between each swatch. Lay them down end to end in the exact same order they were painted, then take a strip of tape and apply it like so. Fold the tape over, trim the tape on the ends, and finally trim the opposite end. This is the target. The remaining swatches are scrap. You can throw them out. The next step is to actually begin painting the color palette, but before I show you that, I want to point out a few things about the goal so that you can get a better understanding of what it is that is going to be shown to you in a moment. If you look at the top row, you'll see the 10 colors that the target has already picked out, 
and each row below that gets a little less saturated, a little lighter. You can accomplish this effect by diluting your paint with a medium or a glazing liquid, which is what I did in this case, or you can add a titanium white to produce tints. That either technique works fine. It all depends on whatever you are doing with your chosen medium or with your current painting techniques. I've already painted the first column, which is straight cadmium yellow. There's no mixing involved. And I'll show you the second column. So begin by adding a very small amount of green to your pile of yellow paint. And the next step is the secret behind this entire process. Don't try to gauge the color on the palette. Instead, take a small amount with the brush, paint out a swatch on a piece of paper or a material that has the same ground as whatever it is you're working on and then bring it up to your target and place them side to side and compare them. This way you could check if it's a match. If it is, you're good to go. If it's not, you should be able to get a clear sense of how much more you need to change in order to get a match. Paint the top row first. This one is not diluted or does not have any white added to it. You'll notice that as I paint this, I'm not covering the graphite dots with paint. The corner of the brush comes right up to the dot but doesn't paint over it. And this is important because once this is complete and all the paint is completely dry, it will be possible to go back with a eraser and erase all the dots so that the final result is really beautiful and doesn't have any graphite smudges anywhere. The next step is to create a diluted mix for the next row down. So take your batch and cut it in about half and then with whatever you're using to dilute it, either a medium or a glazing liquid or a, a white, mix something like a 50-50 amount. You may have to practice a bit to get a sense of how much it takes. Mix it up and move on to the next square. The most important thing is to be consistent. So after you've made your second row and you're ready for your third row, lay, take your batch, which is now much larger because you've added additional glazing liquid, cut it in half to about the same proportion as you did in the previous step, and lay out about the same proportion of glazing liquid. So by consistently mixing up the same amount in each step, your increments will be approximately equal going down, and more importantly, going across. This is the basic procedure. Just follow this for the rest of the rows and columns, and you'll be on your way towards completing your first color chart. Well, there you have it. All you need to do now is go through your color palette and mix up every possible pair of color combinations so that you have a complete record of everything that your palette is capable of. This will give you deep insight into what you can do with your options, and if you choose to change your color palette or design a new one altogether, you can do it in a manner that is systematic and will give you a guide for future decisions. So, I hope you've enjoyed this video and learned a lot from it. Please like me on Facebook. You can see the link in my profile page. Or even better, check me out on eBay where I have my own original paintings for sale. And I plan on uploading more videos in the future with instructions like these and other such things, so please subscribe so that you can be updated on a regular basis. Thank you again for watching.